Coach. Thanks for joining me today on Simple Coach to Coach. Um, really do appreciate you taking the time. I'm, I'm getting now it's July, and so we're now in the downslope of trying to get all set for, for preseason. So for you to carve out some time in your day is, is really appreciated. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be, be a good time. So I got a bunch of things to say to you. We ha we have a long history, and okay. I don't know if you realize it, but I am a Mount Union grad. I graduated in 1990, and we played against each other on multiple occasions. Um, I remember you as captain, so I think maybe my junior year. I was a goalkeeper for three years, and then my senior year I played center forward. And I've played in your at BW, um, I think, twice. And um, I don't harbor any resentments or issues, but I think my senior year you actually beat us. So I, I, I do have harbor a res resentment for the last 30 years. Um, but I, that's why, believe it or not, that's why I was looking right. forward to because you're the f probably the first coach I've interviewed that I've actually played against. So, And I think at the time your coach, Oops. I forget his name, but he ended up going to South Carolina. I think it was university. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, Murray Hart. Yeah, Murray Hart. And and had some experience. had success down there. So, um, so yeah. So so and and at the time, the stadium had that old school turf, not the new kind that looks like grass. This was like the flat, like no cushion. Um, yeah, that's the, that was the part I remember. Everybody was in flats trying to play. Um, yeah, I remember. Good times, good times. Hey, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then after the game, you just felt like you got hit by a by a Mack truck, you know, from from hitting that hitting the ground so many times. But hey, so so again, thanks for joining. You you've been the head coach for, I mean, at BW, your alma mater, for like 20-some-odd years. I think it's 20 is what I read. And, I mean, you, again, I just knew you as the player, but you've had a lot of success both at BW as a head coach and, and you know, as a soccer coach in general. I just wanted to, to, to read some of those things out. Like, I mean, the accolades are pretty astounding. Again, not not even realizing this, but, um, I mean, you're inducted into the hall of fame for the Ohio collegiate soccer association. You are received, a Ohio's director of coaching award for exceptional contributions and growth and development of the game. You've worked with us soccer, um, in ODP. Um, you've served as a professional match evaluator for MLS, I presume Columbus, you've been down there, or maybe other places, but you're a member of the U.S. Soccer Coaching Educational Instructional Staff. You obviously have all the licenses under the sun, including the A, and now you're serving as a regional chair for United Soccer Coaches, the All-American Selection Committee, and the, elect and the executive board. But so, you know, with all of that, what may, maybe you could just talk about sort of your your journey and how you ended up where, um, you know, sitting where you are. Well, it, it's, you know, I've been, I've been very fortunate. And so just before we get going oh. for that, I am not a BW grad, just so we're aware. I, I went to uh, Hiram College um, and graduated in 1988, Hiram, a long time ago. Really? Uh, from okay. I, so just, uh, maybe that's where I saw you when you played yeah, on grass right. and your head coach was the, um, was the, um, played at Akron. He was a goalkeeper. I forget his name. Anyhow, Kenny, well, Greg Kenny uh, I worked with Greg Kenny for a while, but uh, yeah, but no, Murray, uh, Murray Hartzler was a coach at Hiram, uh, probably 1983, uh -huh. and I think his last year was 1992, 93. Right. Okay. Um, then he All right, so I confused the schools. So, okay, so, Hiram okay. still. All but, right. Uh, <laughs> it, it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> In Ohio, it's, it's a small private school. We're good to go. But, um, um, no, I mean, I think, um, 
really the the pathway to get here was just just kind of odd for me to, and more i would say just to get into coaching i had no interest in coaching um uh, really didn't and uh, i was down playing a little bit after college um you know, trying to trying to get some direction what i want to do when i grow up type stuff and uh, my brother's high school coach reached out to me about taking over the team because um it's not one you see in the soccer world very often but he was a ballet dancer and he was asked uh, to go to russia uh, and serve a, a sabbatical term so he had he had no coach it wasn't one of those he wanted to give the program up he just needed somebody basically to fill in for a year and um you know, I had kind of part-timed it when I was in high school. Uh, it was crazy. Probably, probably my first experience with with coaching was a, a youth team in a, in, a, in a little town outside of Cleveland called Bay Village. And it, to this day, it was probably still, <laughs> arguably, the best team oh my I gosh. ever coached. Uh, Brad Friedel, <laughs> three World Cups. Uh, was like captain of the under twenty. I mean, we won the state championship like nine nothing, and I'm like, oh, this is easy. They just show up and. Uh, that was and, the pinnacle and, of your and career, and it's been all downhill down. since. <laughs> Absolutely, but um, but no. So you know that that kind of started the coaching bug for me, and uh, I loved it. I realized um, I really enjoyed it, so started doing club stuff. I uh, was helping out a, a couple uh, colleges and universities down in Virginia, and then I moved back uh, to Ohio in 1993, and and just. Uh, you know, again, just started, uh, I helped Murray a little, uh, his last year at Hiram, and then kind of took a little bit more of a uh, senior role, for lack of mm -hmm. a better term, with uh, with Greg Kenny when he took over, and it was doing a job. And at that point, uh, mm -hmm. I was asked to, to get on to the ODP staff, and it just kind of started yeah, yeah. kind of snowballing. Oh, that's was, interesting. Awesome. That's, um, a lot of guys seem to, I talk to, at least initially, kind of, I don't want to say stumble, but they like sort of stumble into the whole coaching thing they love the game and just sort of sequence of events and then you land a, you end up landing somewhere where you're like yeah i can do this this would be fun um so and and your exposure go to to the game is i i mean it's is really really deep so and i've been asking coaches this like from when you started to where you are now and the players you recruit now do you think players over over that time, your 25 years or what have you of experience in the game, do, have they gotten better? Are they better technically? Are they smarter players? Are they consistently the same, you think? or Yeah. No, I, I think it's all of the above, really. Um, you know, even, even in my time at BW, I mean, just just over, over the last 20 years, I mean, the... The players are just so much more technically proficient. Uh, they're they're cleaner on the ball. They, they um, and I think probably where the, the biggest difference happens is I just think they're uh, they're better soccer players. They understand the game. They, they understand their their role. They understand uh, jobs. And uh, uh, no, I think the level in general has has gotten significantly higher. Certainly from when I first started coaching. But um, like I said, if you if you looked at the Ohio Athletic Conference. Uh, from when oh, I started yeah. to to now, yeah. it's it's when not we even were close. playing. It was it was a, I mean it was bloodbath every weekend, right? Like that was the bloodbath in the mud on Twenty Third Street. Um, but, do you, the, you mentioned you said that they're good. They understand their roles. Do you think they've gotten more creative or less creative over that time? You know, list improvid. It, I, I'm, I'm, another big thing I'm thinking about is just sort of like the improvisation of players, right? I know they can pass a ten, make a ten yard pass, an easy ten yard pass, and they can do it a hundred times on a dime. But do they, right? Do they think differently? Do they look at the game differently and think I'm not going to make the ten yard pass, but I see a twenty five yard pass that I can ping? Yeah, I, I think they, they see it a little bit differently. Certainly they have the technical range to play balls that they couldn't play uh, 20 years ago. I, I do think, um, and it's like a good news, bad news, I think there's a lot more structure in their in their development. So they're playing uh, probably more year-round. You're seeing high schools now starting around Memorial Day, and they'll go all summer in leagues and contact days, and then, and then pretty much 
at the at the end of the mm-hmm. high school season, they're they're jumping right into club, so they don't they don't get any breaks. Um, and I think a little bit just because of the you know, they're training three times a week, they're playing games on the weekend. I think when they're they're not on the field mm-hmm. with their team, they're not playing the game. And I think sometimes where you get that that little bit of extra creativity, that little bit of um, extra stuff, you know, is is yeah. basically a, a popular term is street soccer. Yeah. They just go out, they just play, and they try new things, and they and they do that. And I don't know, yeah. um, I don't know if kids are doing that as much, you know, because they have just so much, yeah. so much things that are structured. I mean, it's it's crazy to, uh, we we actually did an experiment here at the college like like two years ago, and it was basically we just showed up, dropped off the equipment, and mm-hmm. just kind of sat back and just said, "Guys, it's yours, go." And they the inability of of kids. To really just kind of organize themselves and and get something happening and, and playing was was lacking and it kind of proved my point that I was going these yeah. kids don't they're not playing street soccer yeah. you know you, you think back in the day I mean when um, when school ended depending on the season you were doing mm-hmm. soccer you were doing basketball you were doing hockey you were doing foot you know just you just always yeah. um, you wanted to get out of the house and you just went and did stuff and, and the kids in the neighborhood you know were, were in the same boat. Yeah. So you all got together and did things. Um, now with you know technology and video games and and like I said, I think more of a of a real rigid structure in in youth sports. I don't think it's a soccer thing. I think it's across the board. Um, you know, it's almost like the kids are like on a day they don't have soccer. It's like, oh my god, thank God I have a break. Um, instead of going and, and finding that, a way to, to get out there. Like and play. I, it's very true. I do think it's they play so much and they are so structured. That the last thing they want to do is go outside and with a couple buddies and play some sort of game, um, because they they do it so much, you know. And I, I do think that robs them of sort of that unique understanding of what it means to be like showing up at a park and handing out pennies and organizing themselves for a quick game and sort of letting them, you know, fly. No coaches, no nothing. But um, that's a that's a great observation. Hey. So, with that in mind, what sort of players do you look for at PW? Um, mm-hmm. I look for I look for character guys first. I mean, it's um, in a college setting. I mean, you went to you went to a, to a college. You get it. It's there, there's a different a different layer of responsibility that they have. They're they can't turn off being a being a Bob Walls player. They're, they're doing that twenty four seven three sixty five. So, you know, I need. I need guys that I can trust, guys that, because um, uh, they're only going to be with me for probably two hours of the day. What are they doing? What are they doing the rest of the day? Are they are they uh, are they living the living the lifestyle? Are they living the culture that we've built here at the program? So there has to be a, an element of trust, and it really starts with, with their character. What are they about? And I don't know. It, that, that's a great question because I, I think. If you were going to try to put it in, into little one-liners or, or little taglines, is I, I think for me is I, I want to be around people that want to get better. It, it's uh, in the classroom. They're not just they're not just coasting. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna do their very best, knowing that they're not gonna get A's in every single class. Okay, on the soccer field, um, I want I want guys that that come in um, and, and bring a mentality that they're they're gonna get better. I mean, one of the things. Uh, over my time here, that I'm I'm very proud of is that we've we've put guys into the next level. We've had guys playing in the USL. We've had guys playing in the NPSL. Uh, we've had guys playing in the old NASL, and and certainly they they weren't pros when they when they got to campus. And and understand, I'm I'm taking very very little credit for that. That that 98 percent of that is the player, but. You know, they came in with that that mindset of I want I want to continue to grow and continue to get better, and then if we can mesh that with a with a great learning environment, next thing you know, you've got you've got guys that are mm-hmm. that are really really high level um, players. All right, so it it sounds like you what you built at Baldwin Wallace is special, right? It's like like you mentioned, you know. You know, you're a BW player. You're there. You're for 24/7, 365. Like you're always representing Baldwin Wallace as a soccer player. Um, you know, how how long do you think it took you to get to a spot like that? Right? Like when you first started out, and and you're 
you're building a program to the way you want it to be or how you envision. How, how long do you think that took before you can talk about a BW culture? Um, I, I would say pro- probably probably year three, I think we, we had kind of turned the corner. Um, it was, uh, uh, obviously, I got hired in February, so the, the first year there was really no no recruitment. It's here's your team. Good luck. And, um, you know, anytime there's a, there's a change in, in, in the leadership, there's, there's going to be kids that kind of dig it and kind of buy in. And there's going to be other kids that, that resist it. So, um, that first year was a challenge and, and just trying to, trying to lay a foundation, trying to figure out who's, who's going to, who's going to get on the bus, who's going to be part of the, part of the journey. And, and then certainly that first year, we were able to get out and, and start bringing in players that we felt could, could help build the program in the, in the direction we wanted. Um, and like I said, probably by year three, with, with two, uh, two really strong recruiting classes, um, uh, good temperament guys, leaders, that even guys at, at, uh, at a young age that could lead. Uh, were, were very, very important. So mm-hmm. um, I think around year three, yeah, it's, yeah. it started really, really um, taking shape. Yeah, that would make sense, too. And you're bringing in your own guys that you've recruited, so you're starting to get the types of players that you actually envision. All right, so I, I have to ask some OAC questions um, as being a former OAC player myself. But, you know, John Carroll has been dominant in the region and in the OAC for – a number of years now and I think they've like won the conference or at least made the tournament final I think the last six years um, but do you have any sense as to why they're they are so dominant and then obviously the, the follow-up and at this point I'm not I don't care who would knock them off their throne but it, that would be nice to see <laughs> that's absolutely no I think uh, I think there are nine other coaches that would share that sentiment of um, Kind of knocking them to the floor, but um, no, I, th- I think in in general, and I think this you know is is a piece part uh, comment is the level in the OAC right now is off the chart. It um, I, I would probably even say over the last five years we have seen enormous growth in in the OAC, which is great. It's a, it's a good news, bad news. Uh, uh, the good news is we're part of a conference that has. Uh, a really, really good standing. The bad news is every every game is really, really tough um, and really, really competitive. So, um, you know, I think as far as far as John Carroll's success, um, you know, I think they're they're in a cycle right now that it, it's just kind of feeding on itself, and, and it's just uh, it's really up to everybody else in the OAC just to, to kind of catch up and, and knock it down. I mean, it, it, you know, through my tenure here, I mean, there was a period where Wilmington College was was really really good um and then obviously the, and they're and they're good now but it's just more of a that mm-hmm. cycle how northern went yeah. to the uh, yeah. division yeah. three championship i think in 2012 yeah. maybe um you know so they had a period where they were they were dominant so it just it kind of works on cycles but i think the one thing with john carroll is um even back when when i was playing i mean they were yeah. they were always well, I, they yeah. were always good so yeah. i think it's it, you know, I think some of it, you know, location. I mean, uh, we're on the west side of Cleveland; they're on the east side, so we're both kind of attached to a to a larger market, and, and certainly a market that uh, has produced good soccer players. Cleveland's always been a, a very, very strong area for soccer. So, you know, I think they're they're getting some local guys, and then I think, um, you know, with the, their religious affiliations, I think I think that does give them uh, uh, an advantage where they can get out and, and recruit a little bit, probably more more regionally, nationally than, than a lot of teams. And we all have little yeah, niches sure. and things that we can uh, take advantage of. But I think they, uh, you know, they've done a, they've done a good job and they've, they've certainly uh, uh, built a very, very strong program. But, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think uh, I think everybody's about tired of, uh, of seeing them near the top. And, it, and if we could, uh, uh, we could knock them down a little bit, yeah, I think yeah. that would be great. It, it's interesting because, um, you know, I've been watching whatever streaming out for Mount Union for, you know, as long as they've been streaming the games, I, you know, watch when I can and to follow the school, right, Just because because of, of it. But I never looked at it in the context of the OAC. And then this past year, for a whole host of reasons, part of that explain this channel. I just started watching a ton of games, Division Three games, all Division Three, and you know, upwards of two hundred. And I started to 
you know, hey, I should take a look at, you know, some of the teams in the OAC. Um, but I really wasn't there until some guy on the on D3Soccer.com said probably the most underreported story is how good the OAC actually is, soccer-wise, and how many teams top to bottom. And it's probably one of the toughest conferences um, uh, in, in the country And and to take a look. And I started to watch, and the quality of the soccer, like to your point earlier is dramatically improved from from obviously going way back to us but even you know even more recently just amazed i'm amazed at the quality of players that the oac starts to attract and i don't and that's a, that's a, i think that's a statement of you know how good ohio western pa all, that whole area does in terms of soccer these days but um and you see it reflected in all the teams um you know, your the the other OEC question I ask is, you know, o, OEC is probably more well known on the football side, um, just in in terms of and Mount Union obviously um, doing what it does, and you know, there's always the national rankings, and and, and I was just and BW is is up there as well, and it, it it has a I think it won a national championship maybe years ago, I can't remember, yeah, it did 1970, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, do you, do you think that sort of those that sort of that helps you helps you from a soccer perspective hurts you does that just that that the OAC is has this recognition as a as a heavy football conference and certainly it, it is it is a heavy football conference but I think if you if you pulled most of the coaches um, I mean, and put it in context. I mean, uh, eight teams made the College World Series, um, and two of them were OAC teams: Bob Wallace and, and Marietta. Okay, so you know, it's not just a, a soccer phenomenon; it's not just a, a football phenomenon. I mean, I think the the level of uh, quality athletic programs in the, in the Ohio athletic conferences is is really astounding. And I think with soccer, I think in some ways we we kind of caught up. I mean, if you look at uh, positives of football, certainly uh, oh, facilities. Yeah. I mean, everybody is now, um, in fact, outside outside of Heidelberg, and they do have, they do have a turf stadium. They just have a um, an auxiliary field, kind of mm-hmm. like the old Twenty Third Street complex yeah. down in Alliance. But uh, uh, everybody else is playing on a on a yeah. lit turf field. Um, so, you know, is that a is that a byproduct of football? Mm-hmm. Probably, you know, it's just it. it uh, you know, schools started realizing the the importance of, yeah. of facilities. I mean, we have a we have a student athlete uh, weight center here, and I, I think there's a handful of schools in the OEC that have something mm-hmm. very very similar to that. Um, the gyms, the, the the pieces, parts. I mean, we're we're really fortunate here. Uh, a couple of years ago, they built us a, a, a brand new turf lit uh, mm-hmm. training field. So it, it, we didn't have to wait till football was mm-hmm. done in the stadium. We could go do our thing, and I think that that was yeah. huge for us. And uh, so I think uh, there's that resource, and, and um, in some ways, I, I think there are schools out there that realize that they're never going to compete with the, the Mount Unions and the BWs mm-hmm. in football, but they could really compete in in, yeah. in soccer. So I think there was almost. Uh, Hey, can we make this the marquee sport of our, of our fall yeah. sport profile? And so they've contributed a, a lot of resources there. I mean, some have, have chosen uh, yeah. women's soccer, some have chosen volleyball, some have just gone across yeah. the board. But uh, but no, I think if you, from sport to sport, um, uh, relative to the rest of the country, the Ohio Athletic Conference is, yeah, is yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, really I mean, I was talking to Joe Bergen down at Marietta, and and you know they have. This year, baseball obviously what baseball has done. I think they lost in the in the World Series, but um, their basketball is outstanding. Men's basketball is just outstanding down there as well. And I, I'm always curious about that. And and I do I have noticed a definite commitment in the OEC to athletics more generally speaking. And I always use Mount Union as a case study of how important it is for a school to, or realizing how important a school is to have a, a, a really prominent sport, in that case football. I mean, 
the Mountain Union looks nothing like when 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 I played there. It looks nothing like it. Like it just totally transformed and um for the better, right? And um and I think that reflects I think you see there's a lot of schools who are gonna make that claim, right? So Um Hey, I started asking this because I never never um you know, COVID was not that big of a deal for me because I've always worked from home. This office has been my office for seven years now, so it's not, it didn't really impact me to stay at home. But I was just, I started asking, like, how, how tough was COVID for, for you all at Baldwin Wallace? Or, you know, was it fun? Was it, was it a good experience? Uh, I don't think anybody said it's fun, but I throw that in there. Yeah, no, I, I don't, uh, uh, yeah, there was nothing fun. There was nothing good about it. Um, uh, I, I do, I do think the university on a whole did a did a tremendous job dealing with it. Uh, we we had in person uh, learning uh, that fall, even that fall semester, and I think um, initially there may have been even a, a, some questions, maybe uh, uh, potential criticism uh, of of the fact, but. Um, you know, I give our administration a ton of credit. They they, they pulled it off. You know, the uh, finding ways to, to to create the right environment, but do it in a safe way. And um, yeah, they uh, they did something that I don't think a lot of people um, expected to be able to go through. You know, from an athletic standpoint, um, yeah, it was, it was just absolute <laughs> chaos. I mean, I think I think probably the probably the biggest part that was probably the biggest challenge for for the kids was was simply everything changed rules changed every day you know so you, you there was no pattern there was no let alone if you had a, a little mini outbreak in, oh a, in a certain group of, of people but just just in general i mean it, and, and i get it i mean everybody was just trying to get their hands around how can we how can we do something and, and, and make it safe should we be doing something um you know, but uh, the number of times where we would we would start on a Monday, and by the time we got to Friday, the the protocols are, for lack of a better word, the rules all changed. So, so I, I guess a byproduct for you know, if if we're looking for silver linings, is is our kids became really really adaptable, just because it was just uh, um, it was just very very chaotic. Um, I think they became very very resilient, and I think in some ways. Because it was taken away, and, and we had talked earlier about you know these kids, and, and there is a, there is a burnout effect with, with young players. They, they start playing at U8, and they're traveling all over the country, and they're uh, they don't have a break, and they get the their end of their high school career, and they're like, okay, I'm done. Um, uh, but I think with with our players, it was probably the first time in a long time that they'd had an extended break from the sport, and I, I think if anything, they, get, they they had appreciation for it. They're like, wow, I really miss this. You know, sometimes you can get caught up in that in that rut. Everything just kind of monotonous and kind of goes through. And um, you know, I think when it was taken away, I think the uh, the guys appreciated it a little bit. And then when they came back, they were they were just really really excited just to yeah. be playing again. But as far as um, you know, we didn't we didn't do anything. And we just did training in the fall, they uh, did an abbreviated spring season, so we played. Uh, yeah. Nine games we played yeah. just within yeah. our conference, um, and um, yeah, I mean everything was just just different. I mean we played Thursday and Sunday, and uh, it was it was a really short period. Obviously, you know trying to prepare a team in middle of February in Northeast <laughs> Ohio is probably not uh, not, the, not the easiest. Break thing, out uh, the orange I ball, man. <laughs> yeah, no good. No good. And like I said, we're, we're really lucky. We've got we've got yeah. two turf facilities where we could plow. But I remember we were actually uh, we were actually playing John Carroll, um, and it was April, but it was fairly early in April, and we got eight inches of snow that day. <laughs> and we're sitting there going, "Are we going to be?" You know, fortunately, we were able to, to plow the field and, and the snow. But you're going, "My Lord!" It was just everything. Just you just had you just had to continually put out yeah, little yeah. fires. Um, so, um, but you know it's. You know, hopefully, I mean, watching the news this morning, it sounds like there's another, another sub variant, yeah. and you know, uh, a number on the rise, and blah blah blah. But uh, um, you know, I'm I'm hoping that I'm hoping that we've seen uh, seen yeah. the worst of it. But uh, but no, I think that the kids got through it, and, and like I said, I, you know, I always I tend to be uh, 
glass half full kind of guy and it's like okay what did what did we how did we grow here how did we how did we get better here and that you know that ability to be resilient that ability to have appreciation for uh just the simple things just to you know to have the coffee shop open to you know to be able to hang out with their friends instead of being kind of sequestered to a to their dorm room and the only person they're talking to is their roommate and yeah, yeah, all yeah. those things no i i, I if there's one common theme that I've heard is it was probably the a number of coaches has commented like to the point you made where and most of these kids have never realized what happens when the game is taken away. But like you said, they've been playing since U eight and doing a blah 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 blah, and then it's gone in a way that they didn't decide. Right? It was decided for them, and I and and suddenly the appreciation of now being able to play again. How great is that? I think. They said a lot of coaches said that the enthusiasm of players now, like, oh my gosh, how much do I love this game, right? And this is um, was a was one of the best things to come out of it all. Um, I, I started asking this as well, and it really does intrigue me because there was, you know, you know, we I forget who mentioned it first, but you know, we started talking about recruiting and, and players, and you know this. Like he was experienced, like a lot of a lot of players have this D one. Um, like they're going to play D one or they're not playing at all. And and I I wonder is is do you have any experience with that? Do you, in the in the types of players that you recruit, is there this D one or bust mentality? And 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 how does that play out for you? And 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 if you have any ideas about how that plays out for those players who are like, yep, D one or nothing. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I do think it, it, it does seem to be um, uh, a trend that that's uh, uh, is not really good, and I think it's it. There were little pockets of, of areas where that seemed to be kind of a prevalent attitude um, in it. You know, I, I can't I can't lump it into to all sports. I could just look at it through the through the soccer lens, but I think. Um, I would say probably over the over the last probably three four years, um, there seem there does seem to be a little bit more of that where there's you know, if I if I'm not going Division One I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play and in the state of Ohio, in particular. I mean the fact is there's just not much Division One soccer on the men's side. You know there's no uh, there's no Toledo there's no uh, uh, no Kent there's no uh, Cincinnati now yeah. has dropped their program. Uh, um, no Ohio University no Miami. You know you start looking at some of the some of the bigger schools, and it's just there's not there's an, there's not an option for Division One, and and you know we've already addressed the fact that that Ohio is a, is a really yeah. good soccer state. So you've got a lot of a lot of quality players that um, there's just just limited limited opportunities for them at yeah. the Division One level. Um, but I think what what they more times than not what I, what I, my experience is is the kids that actually end up doing it and they go play at a uh, at a D three institution in Ohio, they they go play in a, a number of the D two yeah. institutions yeah. in Ohio, and they get there and they're like, "Holy cow, this level!" I mean, we, we every year we'll have that one kid who just came in and thought, "Wow, I thought it was going to be really easy," and I don't really, you know, kid that came from a uh, a yeah. big club, maybe has a big resume, and all of a sudden, you know, he's like, "Oh yeah, I got, I, this. I got this." It's 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 just <laughs> yeah. D three, and all of a sudden they realize. Holy cow! This is um, this level is is yeah. off the charts, and uh, you know I think um, you know it's it's tough. It, 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 I, I wish I had an answer for it. Um, you know I think it's um, it, it certainly is a challenge. But I think that the the kids that end up just that have a passion for the game, they're not gonna they're not gonna worry about that. They're gonna they're gonna yeah. play somewhere. You know, other guys where it's just hey, I'm a good player, but I really don't. I'm not really completely all in i'm not completely yeah. passionate about the game those are the ones that it's a little bit easier to walk away and you know they're looking they're looking for the title they're looking for something it's they can put on yeah, social yeah. media and it sounds yeah. cool instead yeah. of you know what i just i i want to i want to be a, i want to be yeah. a really good player i want to do i want to continue yeah. grow as a they player. want that instagram post you know i committed to blah 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 right like with their picture or something um yeah, that that to me is just sort of is really interesting because I even think the the idea of what Division One soccer is is completely warped into something that is not reality, right? Like I just think it's been 
there's to a certain extent a little glamorized, and I just think they don't realize what Division One soccer is all about. And not to mention, I, as I've been saying, not every school is, you know, Maryland. Not every school is Stanford. <laughs> not every, you know, these programs that are, I mean, for all intents and purposes, the closest thing to professional amateur soccer that there is. Um, and not not every Division One school is like that. And I, I don't know Akron well, so I, I'm not throwing Akron in there or Cleveland State or Ohio State, but, you know, that I think kids think that that's what that is, and it's not. There's a lot of places that, a lot of Division One schools that, you know, have issues like, a, you know, budgets and, you know, facilities and all that stuff, right? So. Well, and you're starting, you're starting to see... Um it's, it's been very prominent at the Division Two level, where the the majority of the players are international, yeah. and and now you're starting to see that even at one the level, Division One well, level. Yeah. I mean, there, there used to be programs there, but I mean now you look at almost every program, and and they're they're international heavy, and then then you throw in the the, the transfer yeah. portal, and now everything in terms of finding a, a destination just gets that much more difficult. I mean, there, there, are, there are programs out there that aren't even recruiting live players. They're recruiting off the yeah. portal. You know, and it's like, hey, I'd rather, rather have a, uh, a guy who, who maybe redshirted a, a year and get him in versus Joe Blow guy from, uh, you know, ex-soccer club that we're not sure what he's going to do. That's actually a great point. I've said this before. I have this ongoing debate with a Division One coach about, you know, player development is a college responsibility and he's a big player development guy and talks about that and then I always I look at him I'm like I just looked at your roster and you have 15 international players so how can you be about player development in the U.S. when these guys are coming from overseas and which he doesn't really have an answer and I get why like I'm not it's not a criticism of it right like they're finding the players where they can find the players but it, there is something I don't know. I, I go back and forth, right? That's maybe why I like Division Three so much, right? Where it doesn't, it's not influenced by that as much. Some schools do, but um, about this influx of international players that invariably, who suffers? It's the, the local kids, right? That are, were at one point might have been players there, but um, you know, it's some, you know, because they can't take them anymore. And I know my, I will just say from the transfer portal perspective and with, with COVID, you know, my son, like so many others, was just a victim of that, right? Like, I had a couple of Division One schools that pulled out last minute and like, look, we got three guys coming back and we got this other kid who's transferring in because he's got an extra year and it just sort of all messed up, messed up things for him. So, but, um, hey, let me ask you, um, and I mean, you're involved on a number of obviously the coaching organization so i'm just curious like wh what are your thoughts on the overtime changes um th this upcoming season will be the where there will be no more overtime games in during regular season no i i think it makes some sense i mean it, it, it's um it's difficult i mean and i know there was uh, some proposals that i think ended up getting tabled um uh, followed it, but uh, you know, wasn't wasn't there as far as Division One trying yeah, to, yeah. to make soccer a, a all in spring season. So, I mean, the, the the fact of the matter is, I mean, we we have to be really really mindful of uh, of squad rotation because we play so many games in such a short period of time. I mean, you know, nowhere else in the world do you play twenty games in in eight weeks. I mean, it's just it's just chaos. Um, so, you know. <laughs> To, t to take away that, that overtime, I mean, it's just, and we were one of those teams that we actually played a, a pretty good chunk of overtime games yeah. last year. Um, yeah. You know, and that just adds, oh. uh, you know, certainly with the, with the golden goal, yeah. you don't know how much it's going to, but it just, it just, I mean, yeah, is overtime exciting? Certainly in the in the golden goal uh, era, it, yeah, it would, it would add some excitement level, but at the end of the day, it just, it just, it's just adding that much more load to yeah. players. And, you know, Everywhere else in the world, um, you know, short of uh, a situation where you're in a knockout world, the Champions League, you know, at the end of the, the, end of the game, it's a, it's a tie, yeah. it's a tie. 
Now, if you have, if it's a decider, then you would go to penalties or, or you do extra time. So, you know, I think for us to, to kind of get in that world of, hey, you got 90 minutes to win the game. If, if you can, great. If you can't, then you get a draw. Um, but when we get into the uh, into tournament settings, the, uh, the OEC tournament, the NCAA tournament, et cetera, et cetera, then, you know, hey, we have to we have to have somebody go through, and, and that's when we'll get the extra time and the penalties. Mm-hmm. I think, I think it's, I think it makes is some it, sense. Coach, is that gonna is that gonna change the way you approach a game? Like now that you know that it's ninety minutes, in your second half you got fifteen minutes left to 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 break a tie. Like, are, are you gonna change that? How you approach that game? Like, how do you're gonna try to win it? Or you're gonna hey, let's get all defensive because I, I'll take a tie at John Carroll away. You know. No, I, I don't think so. Um, and, and certainly, uh, you know, when you when you are playing golden goal, I mean, it's um, you know, back back when I was playing, we we actually won a couple of overtime games like five yeah. one because you had yeah, to play yeah, it out. Yeah. So, um, you know, maybe back then you said to say, hey, let's just make sure we don't give away a, a goal. Let's get it to overtime. We got we got thirty minutes, and you know, chances are in that thirty minutes we'll we'll we'll, we'll get the goal we need or mm-hmm. or goals uh, in some instances. Um, yeah, with the with the golden goal, just how dangerous it is. I don't I don't know if anybody really played to get to overtime. I mean, certainly there are uh, there are, there are opponents there there are circumstances that you you might uh, you know sit back a little bit more. But um, yeah, I, I don't know how many how many coaches would actually you know try to change their their game model to reflect yeah. getting yeah, to overtime. I, I I will say to what what you mentioned earlier just. I just remember my senior year when I when I played forward. By the time October rolled around, between the regular season games, all the practices, and then I thought I think I went back and I looked, and I think we had like five overtime games at the time. My legs were shot. Like how I, you know, and, and then this this past year, I remember watching the finals with Connecticut and Amherst. And some of those guys looked like, you know, just walking wounded, <laughs> trying to play the game. They get wraps all over the place, you know, their legs. Are th- so, um, yeah. And, and the, the last thing I'll say is I, I've been s- sort of saying, yeah, wouldn't it be great? Forget the spring scene. That had never worked Division Three, as far as I'm concerned. I don't even think it works Division One. But you know what? We could aspire to it. But... Um, even if you just add in an extra week to the season, maybe on the front end, right? You get in the beginning of August instead of the middle of August. Like that to me, and you buy yourself a lot of enough to spread out a season to make it a little bit more manageable. But, you know, I don't make those decisions. It's easy for me. One, one more week would make a big difference uh, for a lot of teams. I mean, you, I, I think there are a lot of programs. Uh, uh, we're one of them too. Is where we just you know we don't play our full allotment of games simply because um, you just don't want to you just want to pound your players yeah. into a, in, into the yeah, ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, that's true. That's the other way, right? Like, hey, oh, you know, you don't have the extra week, so just reduce the number of games, which I'm sure has its own issues, right? Like that you have to deal with, but. And we're really, I mean, in the state of Ohio, the small school soccer is good. so good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not only did in the, OAC, yeah. the North Coast yeah. Conference with uh, the Ohio Westlands yeah, yeah, and the yeah. Worcesters and, and Canyons and schools yeah. like that, that, um, you know, we're, we're not spending a lot of time traveling yeah. to get games. Yeah. I mean, imagine if you're a little bit more isolated and, you know, now you have to throw in a, a four to five to six hour uh, yeah, trip yeah. all the time. Yeah. That can really add up. That's quick. what uh, that's what the head coach at Roanoke was talking about. Like it's to the point where they do neutral game, neutral site games to r- mitigate these like crazy drives because they're in the middle of Virginia, not close to anybody, right? And, uh, sure. Hey, absolutely. Th- just a, just about your program. Like, do you have any non-negotiables that you that that you have if you're recruiting me? Which everyone wants to recruit me these days. I'm just telling you. So I have a lot of options <laughs> coming in the fall. Um, do you, like if I were to become a player at Baldwin Wallace, that there's a certain set of things that I have to adhere to. To if that, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big rule guy. I'm more, more about standards mm-hmm. um, than, than a, a, a rule. But, you know, I kind of talked a little bit about it. You know, it's kind of having that uh, development mentality. I mean, if you want to get trendy and use cool, you know, kind of more <laughs> modern words, you know, they have, uh, you know, they've got to have a growth mindset. They've got to be, they've got to be willing to come in and, and think outside the box. Um, and this is something that happens every year. A kid thinks he's a, uh, a six. He's, he's a, he's a CDM, a central defensive midfielder. And all of a sudden, no, well, maybe at, at our level, maybe you're maybe you're more of a two, more of an, of an outside back. Maybe we're, you know, slide up the mm-hmm. team, whatever. So, you know, if a, if a kid comes in and the only thing I can do is this, and they and they don't have that ability to adjust, uh, they're they're probably not going to have a great experience. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's just so many things that happen happen in college that you have to um, you have to think outside of the box. I mean, I. I've, I'm one of those coaches that really likes to operate in, the, in a growth zone. If you're familiar with the concept of a comfort yeah, zone, yeah. Right? I, I can do that here. Yeah. You know, where you where you really develop is in an area they call the growth zone. So we're always pushing. Um, you know, sometimes that's a flaw because I tend to be one of those coaches that just is always always grinding, always driving, always challenging guys to to get there. And, and it's not always it's not always easy. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit easier to operate in your comfort zone when you get into that into that growth zone, it could be a little ouchy at times. Yeah, yeah. And um, so, you know, I think that they need to they need to bring that kind of mentality. And, you know, I think, again, another trendy type of word, and I, I don't necessarily get caught up in all those trendy, you know, but just mm-hmm. uh, an element of grit. They've just got to, they've got to be hard-nosed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, we are, we are big uh, with our team culture. So, I mean, obviously their, their personality, their temperament has to, has to support and, 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 and drive our culture. So if they're, if if it's not going to fit that way, I mean that's probably the one, the one non-negotiable because we've uh, spent a lot of time just kind of building a, uh, in my opinion, a, a very very successful culture. Is mm-hmm. are you gonna are you gonna help it or hurt it? And if you, if you're if you're gonna hurt it, then no time. you know what this this probably yeah. isn't a good spot yeah, for. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If there's, it's amazing. And I'm talking to everybody that I have. Right, what it takes to build a successful team culture is a lot, and how quickly you could lose it is is yeah, all it takes is the one guy, right? That one wrong kid in the locker room or what have you. Um, do you, do you have a do you have a leadership council or do you like do you have a do you have a do you have a group of the players that sort of represent the whole team or? Aside from the cap, yeah, we, we, yeah, we do operate with a, with more of a leadership council, and um, uh, <clears throat> I think it, it's it's been fabulous. There's um, on a, on our campus, we have uh, what is called the Center of Innovation and Growth, mm-hmm. and it's and it's basically a, uh, a a center that's really really driving leadership. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, we we've partnered with them. Oh my gosh, maybe for twelve years now. Mm-hmm. We're we're looking at. Uh, certain methods, certain traits, certain virtues that go into uh, quality leadership and, and uh, high-performing teams. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, it was one of those. It was we were talking with a, a guy named Alan Culp, who was who was kind of the founder of, of this thing, and he ended up being our NCA uh, representative for a number of years. And I was like, my gosh, why why aren't why don't we have a partnership? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a no-brainer. So he. He kind of started that that ball rolling, where we, you know, were almost an active part of of um, of the SIG. Mm-hmm. So, I think that, um, and a lot of times with that, it's it's it, it's grooming younger players to start developing leaders. So it's not a situation where those kids would uh, take seminars in the SIG as seniors. Mm-hmm. They would uh, coaches would would identify uh, freshmen, sophomores that that kind of had that stuff, but almost start giving them a prerequisite. Mm-hmm. Uh, of training mm-hmm. and you know it's uh uh it, it's a short story and i apologize for it, steve no. but i'll just, i'll go with it real quick but it was you know i think i think one of the one of the better teams i had was uh in 2008 mm-hmm. i mean we we got as high as number seven in the country it was a, it was a really really good team and it, and at the end of the year it, it just it, it, you know we had, we had a couple of injuries, you know there were some things i mean we could we could make you know all the excuses out mm-hmm. there and Alan and I were sharing a coffee, and he goes, you know, Reed, you know, what, what's, what's your, what's your takeaway from the season? You know, what, uh, what were you satisfied? You know, you, were you disappointed with the, the way it, it kind of ended? And I was like, yeah, I'm absolutely gutted. 
And he'd ask me, I said, what, do you, what could you attribute that to? And I said, well, I think really when push came to shove, I, I, I don't think, uh, uh, I don't, I don't think our leadership really got it done for us. Mm-hmm. And you know, me included. I mean, I'm a, I am a part of the, mm-hmm. you know, the leaders of the group. Yeah. Just, a, just a different, different shirt, and certainly a hell of a lot older. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, his, his response to me in a, in a typical Alan Culp fashion was, he looked at me and he says, "Well, what have you done to, what have you done to help that? Yeah. What have you done to train that?" And I was like, "Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, here like, we go." Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I tried to answer. Yeah, yeah. Well, why would we I'll take a it? cinnamon, it please. Just <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jack, yeah, let's get out of here. But uh, um, no, so I think you know that that really almost it was like an eye opener of like, what are we doing to train our captains? What are we what are we doing to? Because uh, typically your captains end up being your older players. Yeah. But what are, you, what are you doing with that the next wave? You don't want to wait till a kid's a senior year and just say, hey, good luck. Here's here's the team. Don't don't screw it up. And instead of you know, could you take a group of guys and. Um, and the fact is, I mean, we have we have we're, we're kind of untypical for for Division Three. Then we have a smaller roster, but e- even if you're talking, you know, thirty six to, to forty kids, uh, that's a lot. That's a lot for one or two guys to manage. So when you when you have um, uh, a council, you can kind of spread out the spread out the load a little bit. Mm-hmm. And um, um, you know, it's we've 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 implemented that probably you know, you know, almost since two, uh, 2008. Yeah. That period. Uh, and it, it's it's worked it's worked well for us. So let me ask: Do you is it that you take? Do they are they taking like those identified individuals, freshmen, sophomore caps? Do they take classes, or do you have someone from the center that works with them collectively in terms of leadership? Yeah, they'll they'll have a it, it, it's a colloquial series, so they'll meet uh, once a week for an hour, and then um, some coaches will come in, but it's it it's really uh, it's really driven by the people at SIG. Alan would come in, uh, would kind of lead the class, but uh, uh, David Shapiro, uh, Lacey over there, they would they would they would come over and assist it. So mm-hmm. it's you know it's it's all uh, it's all virtue based foundation. Yeah. So that it's just working on on those skills and and how to uh, how to implement theory into into an actual actual practice. Yeah, yeah. Which you know again there. Almost every kid that that uh, that I've had that's taken a class, I mean, it would say, if it wasn't number one on their list, it was certainly in the uh, top couple that that during their four year career they felt that they got the the, the most, most value. value out uh, of it. Yeah, yeah. I love those yeah, things. Do it. Yeah, yeah. Corporate so, world training like that, I always love the leadership ones. So of all the ones that you could train on, like to me, those were the most the most interesting because there are a lot of. It's about polishing your personality and if you sort of have that leadership dna like it's all about how do you surface that in the, in the most positive way um you know this goes back to the calendar do you, do you how do you prepare for teams that you're playing against in such the 18 games in eight weeks or whatever it is like do you, do you do you put a lot of effort into it, or are you just more of the type that's like, look, we play the way we play, and that's the way it is? And no, it's uh, it's definitely a, a sleep optional time of year. Uh, <laughs> if you can get the you get a couple hours of sleep, that's great. No, I think um, you know maybe to that that second part of that question, I think um, I think we're probably a little bit of both. I mean, uh, certainly um, our style is one that I think is. Um, uh, fairly sophisticated. I think it's um, you know I think it's helped correlate of of how we've pushed players on on to the next level. I mean we try to build. We try to you know, there's a there's a purpose with how we play. So we have certain principles that are 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 pretty rigid. But that being said, you're you're playing against an opponent that um, maybe brings a little bit something different to the table, or they have a a, a certain player, a personality player that that. Uh, you need to be aware of. So, I mean, like I said, we there's not enough time in the day where you can sit there and just start from scratch on uh, Thursday and get ready by Saturday, and then do it again on Monday to get ready for Wednesday. It just doesn't. There's just not enough time. But, but I do think you know uh, we we've entrenched kind of what our playing style is and what it, it looks like. But then we also dive into uh, the team we're playing and just and just making sure that. Uh, uh, there's an alignment there that, that makes sense for us. 
Um, you know, with all that went on, what were your expectations for the 2021 fall? Um, you know, I, I don't, I, I, I don't know if, if, um, if I had a ton of expectations and that sounds like an absolute dodge and I don't mean to, but it was just <laughs> total dodge. Um, I got this recorded. <laughs> yeah, 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 this was, um, I, 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 again, you go back to that COVID piece. I think it was a year that, um, none of us had ever experienced. I mean, we, we were coming off of a, of, of a spring season. And, mm-hmm. and I think when you talk to most coaches, I think they viewed that as, you know, I don't know if it helped us. You know, it kind of screwed up our, our development cycles. Mm-hmm. Um, you had the advent of the NCA giving blanket uh, eligibility. Oh, so yeah, yeah. normally yeah. You, you would, you know, graduation comes and you might get that odd kid who's a, who was a red shirt. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, you know, you, your seniors were seniors and they were gone. Then it was okay of my seniors who's coming back and you know um, you know other teams what what does their profile look like so it was um it was one of those that i almost intentionally wanted to come into the year with with very very few uh, uh, expectations simply because i don't think anybody really knew what the hell was going to be happening yeah. so uh like i said it sounds like a dodge but there is some there is some logic behind it um you know and i think once we once we started playing, I think I think overall, um, I was okay with the year. I, I, I wasn't I wasn't uh, real grumbly, but I, I certainly wasn't uh, wasn't satisfied with it. Yeah. I mean, I think we we had a number of of performances that probably justified a, a different result that we just um, you know we just just gave away a, a chance. I mean, we lost a game at home uh, on a thirty five yard ball that a kid hit with a shin guard. Okay, and it, and it went over a six foot six goalkeeper into the corner, and you're going, okay, you know, here's a million bucks, hit that one again, and there's no, and I'm going home with my money. So, but it, and again, that's sport. I mean, there, there's certainly been years where we've been the beneficiary of that, of that bounce, that referee. I mean, that's yeah. just that's sports. I mean, anybody that thinks um, like that, but I, I do think, um, I do think we grow, uh, grew a bit. I do think. Um, it exposed the fact that that our guys have just got to find that little bit extra to translate a great performance into a, into a result. Because at the end of the day, the result's what matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I will say you lost a lot of a, a number of those games by a goal, right? And and we try not to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like just like, the one. That my point is, yeah. man. That's too close. You know what I mean? Like I look at that, and I'm like, that's the first area of improvement. Right, it's like we're got to turn those around to, to our side, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, it's it's just little things, yeah. um, and, and again, it's just it's just execution of critical moments. We had we had a game inside the OEC where we hit the post seven times and lost one nothing. <laughs> no. But again, you you've got to you you've got to you got to make plays. I mean, yeah, it's just, yeah. um, and I think you know again the the challenge for the staff and and it's and it's a team effort is yeah. is working with the players is. Mm-hmm. You know how can we how can we transform that how yeah. can we how can we do that but uh you know i i think uh, like i said I, I was okay with, with 2021 i certainly wasn't satisfied and i don't think the players were either yeah so. i uh i tell my i i'm a volunteer high school coach and um that's another one of my side gigs that makes nothing <laughs> i get free gear um uh, i tell them ultimately doesn't matter how you play, doesn't matter what you do. The game of soccer is very simple. It is a game of goals. And if you can't score, the likelihood of you leaving the field with a win is greatly diminished. <laughs> you know? So you got to, when you get your opportunities, because they're hard to come by, you got to learn to bury it. Otherwise, you're going to be on the bad end of the, of the scoreboard. So. Um, yeah, coaching soccer in general. I mean, you you got to be half crazy. Yeah, you know, it's only <laughs> I know that you can bludgeon somebody for for eighty nine minutes yeah. and one, <laughs> one one play and, you know goes the other way and then you lose. I mean, that's it's you know uh, our our baseball coach here, Brian. You know, obviously very very successful. You know, went mm-hmm. to the collegiate World Series. And he, yeah. he always just rags on me about soccer. You know, and he's, he's doing it. You know, uh, uh, Good hearted. Uh, good-hearted yeah. way but it's it, it, there's some there's some validity to that i mean it's yeah. just it, it is a very very uh goofy sport that sport, way yeah 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 
it's 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 probably one of the more unpredictable sports out there, right? Like in terms of end result, because you could, like you said, you can bludgeon somebody for eighty nine friggin' minutes, and you and you're just it's not going in, right? Like everyone's had those games. It just refuses to go in for whatever the circumstances are, and then somebody clears it with their shin, and lo and behold, it's a goal, and you lose. Playing it, yep. just can't, you know. Stats, right? Doesn't matter yeah. the stats. So. I'm getting gray hairs just thinking about all those games I've had like that, right? Like, oh my gosh. Um, you, you, uh, for so for this fall, I, I, I I'm trying to shift over because we're so close to it. But like, um, what are your thoughts for the fall? Are you excited? That, that, you know, like your incoming class. Do you think you have some freshmen who who will be? You know who'll be able to contribute right off the bat, or yeah, no, I, I like I like our group. I mean, we didn't we um, uh, we didn't we didn't graduate much in, uh, last year, and, and again, you know, with the, in, this this COVID thing wasn't a twenty uh, twenty one experience. I mean, it's gonna, it's going to carry over for you know maybe yeah. as much as another three years. So I mean, we've yeah. got um, uh, a couple a couple guys coming back to do their uh, their graduate work. Um, mm -hmm. You know that are, they're going to play their fifth year, and uh, and that's awesome. I mean, I think they're they're going to contribute uh, leadership and and quality to the team. Mm -hmm. I think um, the the group we're bringing back is, is is very very experienced. I mean, this is one of the more uh, experienced groups that I've had, and and I do think that uh, a handful of our our young. I mean, I really like our our young guys coming in. I think there's mm -hmm. a, there's some real good quality there. So it's. Um, uh, yeah, I mean it's it, it's tough, especially with the new guys. I mean, I'm never that Mel Kiper guy who's grading the draft the next morning. It's like, okay, I haven't even seen this guy kick a ball on a college campus. I mean, I'm, you know, to, there, there is some there's some educated guessing, and certainly we yeah. have uh, you know a lot of experience here, but uh, which is just another word for I'm old. But uh, <laughs> um, you, know, you, know, you try to use it, and you, you you try to forecast, but. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, even even at having scouted you know U.S. soccer at the, at the highest levels, it's there's still um, there's still some unpredictability with with that performance. But I yeah. think knowing the, knowing the kids, knowing the qualities they have, I I I, I would say I'm I'm very very positive about the, the young players we have coming in. How many kids do you carry on the roster generally, give or take? Give or take, it's it's usually um, uh, again that that low forty, uh, oh, yeah. high thirties low. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, we try to keep it small, but, um, uh, you know, I think this one, this will be, uh, one of the, the bigger rosters we've had just mm -hmm. because, um, um, yeah, again, I think yeah. with some of the, some of the co craziness, stuff, we've had yeah. two fairly large recruiting classes and we've mm -hmm. got a, um, a senior class that, that doubled based on the, the yeah. four guys that ended up. And so right. it's, it, it's just kind of chaotic, yeah. but, uh, yeah, it's tough cause we, we don't offer cuts here. Uh, yeah. we, uh, well, we do our legwork. I mean, we have fitness standards. There are certain pieces, parts. It's not. Uh, yeah. It's not JV soccer. It's not yeah. U nine recreational soccer. There yeah, is yeah, some yeah. some mentality, but we also understand that there is a there is a growth period. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I don't know if you know this, but uh, for 15 years here at BW, I coach both men and women. Okay, so you talk about not having any sleep. Um, <laughs> oh uh, yeah. I didn't. I didn't even. I didn't. I saw that, and I was like. That's that to me still. That's crazy. Yeah, the guy's lost his mind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The guy, the guy's absolutely lost his mind. Yeah. But we had a, uh, we had we had a young lady that came in uh, for us, and and if I was in if I was in a I'm going to make cuts because I, I want to keep my roster at a certain number. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no doubt in my mind that she would have been one of the girls that that we would have cut. Yeah. Uh, she just was uh, emotionally, she was in a bad. In a bad space. I think her soccer was a, was a little bit off. I think, in my personal opinion, I think she was playing the wrong position, mm -hmm. and so we just just kind of treaded water that that first year. And uh, by her sophomore year, she's now been recognized as one of the better players in the OAC. And her junior year, she was actually my first All American. And understand, in, in NCAA Division three, yeah. to be an All American is, I mean, it's rarefied air. I mean, there's yeah, thirty six yeah, yeah. players picked from. F 408 programs. I mean, so it's yeah, yeah, really, really, really difficult. So, so you know, I think I use her as a, as my case study. As like, mm -hmm. you just don't know that that could be that kid where the 
the yeah. light bulb goes on, and all of a sudden you didn't want to you didn't want to cast away a player that that with a little bit of nurturing, a little bit of uh, of development, may be really really good. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. That is that. I love hearing stories like that, right? Because, like you said, it's true. Like there's. You just never know who walks in the door, you know, and what the, what what their end value is going to be. And, you know, one year, it, it, players ebb and flow like the game itself, right? Like, you, they walk in, said they might be off for whatever the reason is that first year. But then all of a sudden, they're on the upswing. And, and if you catch it at the right time, they become invaluable to you, right? And then become the shining example for every kid who complains like, Hey, I'm number forty on the roster. How do I get? How do I bump? I'm like, look at her. She worked her tail off. She did all, and that becomes the example, right? Hey, Absolutely. Uh, um, what upperclassmen? And you feel free to name names if you're comfortable with it. Like, do, what upperclassmen should should I be watching for? Um, because now I'm going to have to watch BW. Um, um, there we go. <laughs> I, it's crazy because now I got like sixty coaches. I promised I have to watch games for, so it's going to be a busy fall. But like, uh, do you have any particular upperclassmen that you think are really going to be great contributors to you, to the program? Yeah, I, I, I think we're we're going to have a handful. I mean, I, and, and I do. Um, uh, I'll be I'll be honest with you. I do hate naming names, but I do think. Um, just in the fact that I think I think two guys are worth mentioning just because they didn't play last year. Uh, Reed Watkins, who's uh, he's, he's battled a, a, a series of injuries, which has really really been difficult for him because I think he's uh, he's a really good player, and uh, we're hoping that he's finally healthy and, and he'll get a chance to to go in his senior year and you know put together a full season. He hasn't he hasn't had one yet, and he's had I mean he had. Uh, loose Frank surgery uh, on his foot. So not only did he break his foot, which is difficult for a soccer player, you did it about as bad as you could have yeah, yeah. before that. He had some blood clotting issues that I mean, he was lucky he didn't lose his leg. So you know, the kid is not the kid is not had a hangnail. He's had some, yeah. <laughs> he's had yeah. some really, really injuries. So yeah. you know, I think you know for him coming back uh, will be awesome. Uh, Dylan Keeling, who's um, uh, certainly going to be one of our leaders uh, to be up to the up to the group whether or not you know he gets the distinction of captain but I think he's got he's got the right stuff mm-hmm. uh, he only played it I think three games he, he had a hernia uh, at the end of our uh, preseason last year so he he came back late in the year but it was just mm-hmm. you know I, I give the kid credit he kind of gutted through it but it wasn't yeah, yeah. it wasn't sharp I mean that's yeah, that's unfair yeah. to ask anybody to do that to, to yeah, take yeah. that kind of time so, so I think those are those are two guys that I would highlight just simply because they weren't there. But I mean, I think um, uh, yeah, the BW group in general. I think co- coming back, I think we I think we have some real quality, and I think uh, uh, I'm excited to see how it all comes together. And ready to knock off John Carroll from their perch, right? Like that's that's what this is all about. No, <laughs> I really liked um, Dayon. I thought he was a great guy, great really insightful. But it kills me, kills me, kills me. And I have to get a hat. So um, it, let, it, t- just want to shift over to recruiting, and then I'll let you have your, your, the rest of your day to get prepared for this, for the fall. But you, you familiar with those recruiting websites like the NCSA? And, um, yeah. Uh, do, you, do you use those? Are they any value to you in your recruiting process? Or are you more like, I just want to see kids play? I want to personally see kids play. Uh, both. I mean, I, I think if, if I if I had my if I had my druthers, I would I would I I'm definitely I mean between myself and Nick Talgen, who's uh, uh, my lead assistant and in, in recruiting coordinator. I mean, he does he does. Uh, I give that kid a lot of credit. I mean, he spends a lot of hours on the road. We spend you know I spend some time on the road. I think there's uh, you can get you can see more. Uh, you it, you can look at a kid. You know, it, it, it's crazy. And, and when I do some of my coaching education pieces, uh, one of the things I always talk about is watch a kid at halftime. You know, you get, it, he stands up and he starts doing this, and our guys looking. Oh, here we go again. You know, you know, Joe Knucklehead is is mm-hmm. is pontificating, or is everybody stop what they're doing? Their eyes are focused in and they're listening to every word they say. Okay, well that's telling you. Um, 
boy, this this kid really has the respect of his teammates. This kid's a, yeah. a leader. The, you know, you can you know, even though they're not kicking a ball, there are things you can you can gleam about a player. So and you can't do that. And certainly, uh, the videos have gotten better. They, um, you know, just you know, some of the the VO and some of the technology. Yeah. I mean, I think the actually you know, but the, the number of we times never had you get that man, we had the big carry on thing if we were lucky. <laughs> oh yeah, Dad would hold it, you know, and it's shaking. <laughs> Yeah, you, or or they zoom in just on their kid, and you can't see yeah, the, yeah. the other <laughs> players. But uh, so I mean, I think from a video standpoint, I think we can we can glean more than we used to be able to do. But um, and just so, and just with the the nature of time, I mean, there are pieces parts where it's just you don't have enough time. So I think we um, we we will utilize it. I mean, I think the NSCA program is is great. Uh, uh, Jeremy Tisal, a buddy of mine, is is a is a pretty influential guy at NCSA so you know we'll certainly work with them quite a bit mm -hmm. um, other services um, you know it's uh, uh, it, it's been good so I mean I think what we try to do is to get as, get as many eyes on a kid as many times as we we can and, and we'd prefer it to be in person but there's there's also a reality of uh, you know there's only there's only so many of us to, to get yeah, there to yeah, do yeah, that. yeah 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 I'm just curious I, I don't have an opinion one or the other I just know I get the emails all the time and um you know, for my sons about sign up, and I, I just, I wonder, always wonder, like, oh, what's the end result of that? But um, do you, do you have any? Do you go to a lot of showcases? Do you have any thoughts on the on, on showcases? Do you like them as as recruiting opportunities? Or oh, sure. I mean, the more you can go to one facility or at least one uh, geographic area, and and see see as many games as possible in a, in a two three day period. I think those are great. Um, there's also a byproduct of that that uh, by game th or day three of the event, usually the soccer is really poor because the kids are just just trash. Three games in three yeah. days, and you know sometimes four games in three days. So it's um, you know it's it's good and bad. But I mean I think uh, you know I think any time that we can we can see as many. Uh, uh, as many players as possible in, in a in a in a given period is easier versus going to mm -hmm. one high school game and you know there's only going to be a limited number of, of people even at really good high schools. I mean there might yeah. be might yeah. be two kids that, that realistically could come in and help your program. Yeah, so if yeah. you, you know you're using that as the the only basis for building your recruiting pool, yeah, you're going to spend a spend a lot of time in your car for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, but. Let's go to the high school. So speaking of high school, do you do you go to high school games? Do you like high school? Um, do, you, do you find any value in, in being able to see and knowing that the the schedule the your schedules conflict, right? Like it's really hard in the fall. But do you, do you think there's a value to playing high school ball? I do. I, I um and I know that became a uh, a flashpoint for a lot of people with. Um, uh, the U.S. Soccer Development Academies, where you, mm -hmm. basically you're going to play in an academy and not play high school, mm -hmm. and you know I, th I think that I think there's arguments on both sides. I don't think it's an absolute, um, but I, I guess I guess the way I would look at it is this: um, if if a kid's playing in a random club, and, and these clubs are typically, for lack of a better word, an all-star team. You know, there, there's yeah. a kid from. There's a kid from Alliance. There's a kid from Barber, and there's yeah. a kid from, you know, and, they, and they all, they all get together and they go do their thing. Okay, well, the, the kid on Sunday afternoon is is running around, dropping f bombs at referees, kicking people, you know, just doing things that just everything screams, you know, what at, at bush league performance. Yeah, he goes to school on Monday. Nobody knows about it, mm -hmm. and he does that on a Saturday night wearing his school's name. You bet on on Monday Monday morning he's gonna he's gonna be he's gonna be held accountable for that and not from the administration it's all peers and I think I think there's a I think there's an important tool I think that's an important um, method to, to kind of create almost like an internal accountability yeah. and I think um, in the high school setting in, in I mean I know a lot of clubs even the club I work with I mean we we try to be vertically integrated we try to um, you know, have consistent playing styles and things of that nature, but to to get that that interaction with with the U14s and the U18s is it's it's, it's impossible. 
okay? Mm -hmm. Where in high school, there's almost an expectation that seniors teach the young players. And then as the young players progress up, they, they're paying that forward. So they're helping, you know, so there becomes that, that element of, of being a mentor, which I just don't think you get on a, uh, in a club yeah. environment. So I, you know, even though um, certainly the quality at a very, very good club level is gonna be significantly better than, than most high schools. Yeah. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I do think there's also some, some pieces, parts of high school soccer that, that are really, really important and can't yeah. be replicated at a club level. That's that's interesting. I never never thought about the accountability of that. Like that's that's really that is really really interesting, man. You got my. I. I think it's probably the closest thing that a kid will experience, as playing collegiately, right? Not the soccer, just the experience. Like to you said, your peers, your you know the girl you like, you the you know the. You know the parents, the teacher, the professors, whatever. It's the closest thing you're you, you're gonna get to to that experience, and 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 I didn't even think about, oh my gosh, if you misrepresent or you behave poorly or you start yapping at the ref and people hear that, it doesn't go away. Like the next day, you show up to class, your history teacher is gonna be like, man, I watched you yesterday. You were what was that all about right like and, and like you said it's almost that peer environment where maybe there's no pressure but you you become aware of it right like i i don't i don't want people to see that of me right and it just uh, that's really interesting there, there is absolute pressure there's pressure on their conduct and there's absolute pressure yeah. on their performance just because yeah. people are going to know about it um yeah i think it's I, again i think that that driver is just, is just a, it's it's really really important for development. I, yeah. I just yeah. it's just my my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That is, I, I'm gonna cut this up into a little. Anyhow, um, hey, do you do you have do you have uh, ID camps and do you, how much weight do you put in an ID camp for a prospective recruit slash player? Oh, we do. We, we we have one actually coming up on Sunday. Um, we'll have a, a Sunday one, and then we'll do a a, a late fall, early winter one. Um, mm -hmm. And I think they're they're important, but it, we we really cap the numbers. I mean, we don't we don't use ours as as a uh, uh, necessarily a fundraiser. Uh, what, what we're doing is is really really trying to to showcase the the school and showcase us as coaches, and just see if there's a good fit. I mean, I think the mm -hmm. um, Recruitment. If you if you could if you could describe it in one word, it would be establishing fit. Okay, um, I'm comfortable with the size of the school, the, the distance from home, the setting. Academically, my grades are good enough. I like this coach. I might let my mm -hmm. talent is good enough to contribute at a level that makes sense for what my goals are. Because every kid will have different goals. So, yeah. um, and I don't want to get into a, a sports psychology dissertation there. But I think uh, you know, in terms of what we try to do is. Is keep it a little bit smaller, just so so the kids get a lot of one on one, uh, one on two interaction, uh, and and really help establish the the fit. So so we do offer them. It's up on our website uh, uh, mm -hmm. if people want to uh, uh, to register. I, th I think probably our, our winter slash fall we do it like around November uh, is yeah. probably a little bit more highly populated i think i think the summer ones yeah. is it's a lot of underclassmen and just you know kids starting yeah. to get a starting to narrow their list of yeah. um of what college soccer is uh -huh. i'll put the information like about the program and and your camps i'll put in the description um of when this gets posted so awesome um, awesome um hey last question and i'll let you get on with 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 your day and I'm really interested because you, like I said, your exposure, U.S. soccer, all this stuff. But, you know, you're recruiting me. I'm a high school student, extraordinary soccer player to become a freshman soccer player at Baldwin Wallace. When you're talking to me, what is the gap that you think is between, in general, between me as a high school student and what I need to learn to be a successful collegiate player? Did that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I, um, 
Yeah, I mean, and, and it's, it's really a loaded question, but I think okay, if we if we if we simply I like look, loaded questions, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, because there is, you know, going away to college. I mean, there's so many pieces parts they have to they have to learn to take care of themselves. I mean, nobody's uh, nobody's tucking them in at night. Are you are you getting sleep? What are you what are you eating? You know, you don't have your your mom more more times than not sitting there patrolling uh, what what you're eating. So there's there's a lot of pieces parts that go into that that world that are probably more global mm-hmm. for college but if it, if we want to if we want to uh if we want to pigeonhole it simply to game of soccer i would simply say this and it, it is two concepts that um that really really dictate your your performance is is, is time and space okay so at a at a club at a high school level you're going to be afforded a certain amount of space and a certain amount of time to execute things Okay, your your ability to get a ball down. A, uh, do I play the uh, player A, player B, or do I keep it myself? Okay, you're going to be afforded a certain certain amount of time to, to execute that. As you move from from that high school level to, to the collegiate level, you're going to be making the same decisions. You're going to have to do the same things, but you're going to have to do it with less time and less space. And then if you're fortunate enough to move collegially to that. You know, to the professional level, you, it's the same thing. At, at that level, you're going to have less time and less space. So, you know, in terms of what we're we're trying to do with our, with our first year players is um, get them come. You know, it's, it's speed of play, getting them comfortable with their cognitive mm-hmm. speed, their technical speed, so they can they can do more with less time because they're not going to have it in the in the game. Uh, as far as a, a kid, maybe. Uh, Maybe he commits to us in December, so we know that he's going to have eight months before he comes to comes to to our campus. Is hey, what what can you be doing to put yourself in an environment where you're going to have less time and space because that's going to mimic what you're going to deal with in the fall? Is it playing with adults? Is it um, uh, you know putting putting restrictions on yourself? Hey, when you go to training, can you play in two touch instead of three mm-hmm. four? Can you play in one touch? Mm-hmm. Can you can you do some things that, that again, are going to be artificially replicating what you're going to see yeah. on a college campus? So, you know, I think those, you know, again, that that's that's probably one we could take uh, uh, from now to the start of our preseason to talk about. But uh, and I yeah, don't want to yeah. or you, uh, but uh, <laughs> but no, I think that's uh, if I was going to just put it in a, in a little in a segue, it's just getting comfortable playing with less time and space. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Interesting, interesting way of thinking about it, right? Because you know, I've guys said, uh, you know, other coaches, oh, the phys- the speed, the physicalness, and and it's true. Game soccer again, aside from a game of goals, is a game of time and space, right? Whether you have the ball or don't have the ball, and how you're taking advantage of those things, right? And um, yeah, I'm going to think about that for, see, it just opened up a can of worms in my own head. And so now I'm going to be pondering this for, <laughs> for, no, for days. Well, like, on, so hopefully you didn't have a tea time. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, coach, this was fantastic. I really do appreciate you taking the time. Um, I um, I hope to get out there. I, I do, you know, my, my regular job is not being a YouTube influencer. And so I do get out that way, Pittsburgh, Cleveland area. So I'm going I'm, I'm gonna, to, I'm trying to figure out a trip to, to check you guys out and, and, and cheer you guys on. As long as it's not against Mountain Union. Cause, yeah, um, no, we're, 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 down at, we're down at Alliance uh, this year. But uh, no, uh, shoot, yeah. shoot me an email. We'll, uh, we'll, yeah. we'll, get, we'll, get you, we'll get you the VIP experience. Oh, you know, I am a VIP in my own mind. So yeah, that'll be great. <laughs> All right, coach. Thanks. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you.